In his speech, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky thanked Canada for its support in its war against Russia. Canada's support for Ukraine with weapons and equipment has allowed us to save thousands, thousands of lives. This includes air defense systems, armored vehicles, artillery shells, and very significant assistance in demining. Thank you so much. Canada's leadership in sanctions against Russia for this war and terror really encouraged others in the world to follow to follow your lead. We turn now. We turn now to someone who is in the chamber for Zelensky's speech. Ihor Michael Chishin is the chief executive officer and executive director of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Ihor, welcome back to the show. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, that was uh, quite the moment today. You were inside the chamber. What, what was that experience like for you? Uh, it was very uh, powerful to see the energy, both of the, the delegates that we had gathered from across Canada, the parliamentarians, the staff, uh, the Ukrainian refugees who joined us. Uh, we had seen him uh, his speech before in Parliament on video, but it certainly doesn't convey the energy, the passion and the determination that he has as, as a leader, and I think just the, the hope that everyone has in him and in his leadership. I, I, I was struck from the last time he spoke, and, and I was in the UK when he addressed the British Parliament uh, virtually all in English, with yep. a smattering of French and a smattering of anuktitut right at the end. Um, I, I described it as like a fluency born out of the urgency and necessity to speak to Western countries. What did you make of the way he spoke and, and, and using English throughout the entire thing? Well, he's, he spent the last couple of days in New York and Washington uh, dealing with the, 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 lo the various lawmakers there. So I think uh, the president is, is, as always, you know, working hard for his country, adapting to the situation. He knows he needs to speak to the public of Canada and the United States, uh, to political leaders in a language they can understand directly, to make a plea and I think a warning also on, on not abandoning Ukraine, you know, in some of those discussions in Washington. How worried are you about that? I, I mean, the unity here in Canada seems to be across the parties, uh, as we've certainly seen in the way they received him today and what they've said to him. There is issues inside the Republican Party, inside the United States. I mean, how concerned are you? Uh, about where, in, particularly the biggest supplier support, where things might be going? I think you have to think about it on timeline scales, as we know Putin is thinking about it on timeline scales. So in the short term, I think, uh, you know, President Zelensky has just secured continued support, you know, from Canada, United States, other allies, uh, medium term, uh, you know, and then I think we're looking into the long term, and Putin would like there to be another winter of pain. Putin would like right. there to be democratic, uh, you know, partners in NATO uh, in a disunited future, sort of thinking two, three years in the various scenarios that could end up. So I think uh, Zelensky is doing what he can to secure things now for his country, but he's urging us, I think, warning us that, that this is not uh, a short term, this is not going to be over anytime soon, and, and he's, I think, in a way, giving us energy and, and to, to bolster ourselves for the fight ahead. Are you anxious about the U.S. presidential election cycle? I, I, that, that, that can be a real disruptive thing on, mm -hmm. the, on the priorities yeah. and direction of America. I think we'll see where it goes. I mean, here in Canada, Ukraine is not a partisan, support for Ukraine is not a partisan no. issue. We hope there are, there are parts of each party uh, in the United States that have very, various criti critiques and views on Ukraine. But I think the majority of Republicans and the majority of Democrats are you know, uh, united in, an, in a solid understanding of what's happening. And, and we're going to see those those voices through the, the nominations process, through the primaries. Uh, I think we'll see more unity than, than we might see right now. How, how, how should we view the dispute between Ukraine and Poland right now, in your view? Like, uh, Poland is saying they're going to send mm -hmm. no more military equipment to Ukraine because of this dispute between the two countries over grain and, right. and, and, and you know, which is obviously an important export commodity for Ukraine. I mean, are, how worried are you about that? It seems to be a spat that's arisen. I mean, the grain, the grain challenge has been going on for many months in terms of how Ukraine gets grain out to the European Union through Romania, through Poland, and and the the farmers in those countries have been upset about what they perceive as dumping. I mean, those those problems have have risen and fallen and been resolved in weeks. So I, I don't think this is a major spat. I think it's something that's a flashpoint for a domestic political audience in Poland and and we know that you know Poland has been doing more than any country in terms of its fair share of of uh, supplying weapons hosting refugees etc so I think 
I, I think it's going to be resolved pretty quickly. Let's talk about what Canada announced sure. today, the $650 million uh, over three years for 50 armoured vehicles that are going to be made in London, Ontario. Uh, promise in the press conference later of more sovereign financial support mm -hmm. for the operations of Ukraine in, in the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, what's your sense of what Canada put on the table today? It's a serious and substantial announcement. Uh, we, we saw sort of a multi-year commitment, which is, I think, what we've been hearing from the Canadian defence sector, from the Ukrainian government, that, uh, you know, uh, we've been doing things uh, on a as-needed basis, but it really is about a, a determination of a longer-term partnership. Even if the war was somehow to end, we know that the security situation will, right. will not improve, uh, and, and Canada should be a partner for Ukraine in the long term. So I think these, this equipment that was announced today, new uh, as well as details, I think really the emphasis on, on, a, on a training partnership, you know, and the point was made and has been made that, you know, Canada has trained around, I think, 35,000 Ukrainian troops as part of this deployment in the UK. That's saving lives, that's helping them survive and win the war, uh, and that's really kind of a critical thing. I, I don't want to reduce the conflict as a market opportunity. But uh, on what you talked about, like wanting the Canadian defense sector to have longer multi-year because the security situation right. isn't going to change. The bottom line is, is there will be a demand for equipment here. I mean, sure. do you think as a country on the industrial side, Canada has responded to the opportunity and the need presented in this conflict? We have. I don't, again, I don't know the, the source of everything we've been sending thus far. A lot of it has been sending things that we have had in our warehouses or uh, with the earlier LAVs and, and some of those things, these are things that Canada had purchased already for itself but was sending to Ukraine. I think there's an opportunity. Obviously, there's, there's hundreds, probably thousands of jobs in the, in the Canadian defence and security sector, you know, both for our mm -hmm. domestic production and for supplying Ukraine and, and allies. So uh, we've seen other countries in the NATO alliance take that tack, that, that obviously Germany, UK, they have larger stockpiles of weapons and equipment because they produce it domestically and they have those industries and we just... Uh, are on a much smaller scale at this point. So I think it's, it could be a positive for Canada economically. I'm thinking back to when we first met uh, in one of the interviews on the show, the, the security situation and the state of the war in Ukraine. There was no way Volodymyr Zelensky could even safely leave Kyiv, really, right. right? Let yeah. alone leave the country and do this kind of tour where news leaked out early in the week that he was going to be in With Ottawa. His foreign minister and defense minister. Yeah, all of that. I mean, what does that tell you about where this fight is and where the situation in Ukraine is at this point in time, that he can do something like he did today? I think there is, uh, I mean, we, the, the reality is wherever he is in the world, I mean, he is the chief sales person for the Ukrainian cause. And so he, he uh, what he was able to do through video, he now needs to do in person because that is just the more effective way that he can sell the needs of the country I mean, and sell the, the, the plight of his people, as he said today, you know, against the genocide. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the, the armed forces, you know, have been com become confident and they, they shoot down most of these attacks. But the reality is this week, you know, there were, I think, you know, a record number of, of drone attacks that, that Russia is doing. We don't hear as much about it. Not as many people are killed. You know, a warehouse was, was targeted and one person was killed. They shoot down the majority of these things with our air defenses, right. which has to be, you know, kind of part of the story. But um, Ukraine has become, it has become normalized in that way, that the de defense of Ukraine has become so good. I think what I'm seeing, though, strategically is sort of, the question is, okay, defending themselves against constant, you know, drone attacks is one thing, but when, how do they win this war? Yeah. How do we help them win the war other than just defending themselves against constant attack? Right, and just one final point before I let you go. Um, obviously, there's an, an enormous Ukrainian-Canadian population. There's 175,000 people who have fled Ukraine who are being sheltered here in Canada during the conflict. What do you think it meant for them to see President Zelensky speak in the House of Commons? It's a pretty special day. All of these occasions are important, but I think today we had delegates from across Canada, from B.C., Alberta, Manitoba, Quebec, and across Ontario with, with guests from Ukraine. Uh, it's a it's a really special day that makes me think about you know the the historic struggle of my you know my own family of 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 you know those folks who have been refugees and seeing their presidents come and speak to you know our parliament mm -hmm. and our highest institution. It's it's uh, it's a significant day that it reassures Ukrainians that their state, their their nation is uh, recognized internationally and held it to a high degree. You know, it, and, and, and as he said, I think in, in his own remarks, President Zelensky said, you know, our nation, our culture, our 
the country cannot disappear, it cannot be wiped off the face of the earth. So I think hearing that from, from more and more allies, mm -hmm. and, and again, there were so many Canadians in the, in the audience today who've become friends of Ukraine and Ukrainians who've, who've hosted these people. I know there was a woman who drove from Quebec City to be out there. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many friends and passionate supporters of Ukrainians. I think that helps us all get through these difficult days. All right. You heard Michael Chishin. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate Thank that on a much. big day. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your... Thank you very much for your political support for Ukraine. And this is truly support of a leader. And it is global in scale. Because when you are fighting for something, when you are fighting for good in human nature, the false neutrality, neutrality looks obviously immoral. When one sees true leaders, all are there who are afraid to be real, to speak out, to fight, have only two opinions, to change or to be looked down. And I thank you, Canada, for being a real example of leadership and honesty for so many around the world, an example that inspires others to defend life. While well, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky was in Ottawa today, his armed forces were busy at work in the war. This is satellite imagery showing the aftermath of a Ukrainian missile strike on Russia's Black Sea Fleet headquarters in Crimea. Smoke can be seen billowing from the building, and according to Moscow, one soldier is missing. The missile used in the attack was reportedly Western-supplied. Andriy Shevchenko previously served as Ukrainian ambassador to Canada. He's in Kyiv. Mr. Shevchenko, good to speak with you again. David, it's a pleasure to be on your program again. Uh, so we, before we get to the big speech today, I, I want to discuss this reported strike on the headquarters uh, of Russia's Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. How significant is this strike, in your view? I'll just say that uh, we, uh, uh, we try not to talk much about what is happening at the moment. And uh, usually we stay quiet. Uh, until several days, and until some time uh, into the events. But I'll just say uh, this. Uh, we will use all the necessary means to make sure that we can uh, bring Crimea back under legitimate Ukrainian uh, control. And we will target the, um, the Russian war criminals, and we will target the legitimate Russia, Russian military targets no matter where they are, if they are on the Ukrainian territory. Okay. Well, I, I wonder then if I can broaden it out to the overall state of the conflict. I, I, I don't know if you'd call it a stalemate right now, but uh, there's some sense that perhaps the Ukrainian counteroffensive hasn't been as quick or as decisive as a lot of people had hoped. How, how would you characterize the current state of things on the battlefield? David, we are moving forward, and our offensive in the south uh, is uh, slow. It's it's uh, enormously difficult, but yet we are quite confident in the progress uh, we are making. We are liberating our land, uh, and it takes so much effort and time uh, and, uh, unfortunately, human lives to, uh, to go ahead. Uh, but uh, we do see the progress on the ground. And uh, there is a lot of trust in our military command, in our generals, and in the way they, uh, they are operating this uh, uh, this uh, activity. Now, one big lesson here overall, I think we, it's quite obvious, we had given too much time uh, to the Russians uh, for preparations for this uh, offensive. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, more than enough time to build these endless 20, 30 kilometers long minefields. They had enough time to build all the fortifications. So that, again, tells us that timing is crucial when we talk about the immediate needs for this fight, for this battle. Right. That is a good example why it's so important. Okay, no, that, that, that's an interesting point you make, that the delay in getting the equipment and, and the ammunition and the types of military aid you were looking for has allowed Russia uh, uh, to entrench. There's also, David, this, this meant that we had to uh, adapt, we had to change our tactics on the ground we had to switch to nighttime demining activities that uh, also meant we had to ask our allies for emergency resupplies of uh, ammunition 
we had to ask for demining capabilities that we had not been thinking much about earlier. Uh, nevertheless, with all the difficulties, we are moving forward and we are uh, we are quite determined to uh, go forward and liberate our land. It, it was a remarkable day here in Ottawa to see President Zelensky in Canada. When you go back to the early days of this conflict, you, it wasn't safe for him to leave Kiev, let alone leave Ukraine. Um, how are things in the capital right now where you are? How is life in Kiev? 19 months into this? Well, it means that the war reminds of itself every minute or, or every hour uh, through airstrike sirens, uh, through uh, funerals, through, um, uh, through volunteer activities, people who are trying to collect some money and help the front line. It's something that each of us has to deal with every day. Mm. Um, that includes my family. My wife is a news presenter, just like you, and she is on air from day one. My two daughters, they go to schools here in Kyiv, but they, ho they have to navigate their classes between the airstrike sirens. Right. So that's why it's so important that the people around the globe can hear President Zelensky, can hear our voices, and we can talk together how we can move forward. Well, the main thrust of President Zelensky's tour here to North America was, was to shore up support for Ukraine's defense against the Russian forces. Is there concern in Ukraine that Western support could begin to soften uh, as this war drags on or that it is softening in, in some countries? Not at all. I actually feel that we are in a good position to reshape the international coalition that we have. This coalition was created to help us survive and we will be always uh, grateful for that. Now it's the time to reshape this coalition and make sure this is the coalition to win the war and build sustainable peace. And I think this is the key message that Zelensky wanted to bring to Ottawa. Yes, it is going to be a long fight. We are capable of winning it. And to win this war, it's not just about stopping or ending the fighting. It's to make sure that we can buy 20, 30 or more years of sustainable peace in the world. Well, you mentioned the message he brought here to Ottawa. How do you assess the president's speech today here in the House of Commons and more broadly uh, what he said and, and how he said it on his tour of North America? I think he obviously wanted to thank Canada in person for all the support we have been enjoying. He understands quite well the multipartisan nature of this support in Canada. He also wanted to make sure you know that you're on the right side of history, but also he wanted to invite you into this longer strategic conversation about the future. And that means some practical things. That's why it's so important that today we heard about switching to multi-year uh, finance programming when it comes to the Canadian military support for Ukraine. That is why it's so important we talk about the future force structure, we talk about the capabilities coalition. We, this war is, we must sure, we must uh, make sure that not just we uh, liberate the Ukrainian land, but we diminish the Russian capabilities to strike and assault in a big way for decades to come. So I think uh, Zelensky wanted to, to bring this sense of uh, gravity of this conversation, of this activity, of this strategic planning to Ottawa.